injuries, spinal cord injuries, stroke, chronic pain. Um, came here as an intern in 1998 and just never left. So fell in love with the place, uh, fell in love with this type of work. And uh, it is a very challenging, but also um, engaging uh, career that I've had here at QLI. And uh, plus, you know, just living in the Midwest. Um, was raised in the South and being in an area where there's actually four seasons instead of, you know, two and a half. Um, that's one of the things that have kept me here. Great, uh, great area to raise kids too. Our kids are now grown and out of the house. Well, I wanna say thank you to the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa for the opportunity to present this topic to you today. And what we're gonna be talking about um, is the topic of headaches and particularly headaches after traumatic brain injury. But I wanna start with headaches in general. So outside of the realm of individuals who've sustained a TBI, what are the most common types of headaches? So sinus headaches is one. Now for the purists out there, that's not really considered a primary headache. Um, according to the Mayo Clinic, around 90% of the people who see a physician with complaints of a sinus headache are actually found to have migraines instead. So we'll take that one off the table for now. Attention headache is a very common complaint. It's the most common type of primary headache. Generally starts gradually, middle of the day, feels like a tight band around your head or a constant dull ache on both sides of your head. It can involve pain spreading to the neck as well. Uh, tension headaches or tension type headaches as they're called usually last a few hours, but they can also last over several days. Um, headaches are typically only diagnosed as chronic condition if it occurs on 15 or more days per month for at least three months. That's true of migraines as well. Now, migraine headache is the second most common type of primary headache, and it often occurs as a pulsating or throbbing pain. It often occurs only on one side of the head, although that can switch sides. During a migraine headache, one typically experiences a variety of symptoms, including lightheadedness, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound, nausea, possibly with vomiting. It can also involve other sensory disruptions, such as changes in vision or changes in speech. And the third type represented here are cluster headaches, usually sudden in onset, very brief in nature, usually 15 minutes or so is typical, up to about three hours at most. Um, cluster headaches can occur repeatedly in a single day, and they're called cluster because they tend to arise frequently for a period of time, typically four to 12 weeks, and then disappear. They tend to happen around the same time each day or even during the, the night. And during these clusters and in between these episodes or clusters, the individual may have no symptoms at all. So remission periods can last months or years. These episodes are marked by very brief but severe pain, usually behind one eye. Because of the sudden nature and sudden resolution of these events, traditional over-the-counter painkillers may not even start to work before the cluster headache is gone. Now, we we'll wanna talk a little bit about um, headaches that are secondary rather than primary. So in other words, these are headaches that arise from another condition. For hypothyroidism, for example, migraines and headaches become more frequent and more severe. As hypothyroidism increases in severity, there is a corresponding increase in the frequency of headaches, and the exact mechanism of this connection remains largely unknown. With regard to hypertension, although you can find claims in the literature that hypertension or high blood pressure is associated with tension headaches, Studies that have looked at this relationship have concluded that there's little evidence that chronic atrial hypertension in and of itself is a causative factor in headache. So there's little evidence that that is the case. But there is an association in that headaches are associated with various disorders that lead to abrupt severe elevations in blood pressure. By way of example, a hypertensive crisis is associated with headache as a symptom in around 20% of the cases. Also, acute hypertensive response to exogenous agents like cocaine, amphetamines, um, tyramine-containing foods if you're on an MAO inhibitor medication, all of these can cause what are called hypertensive emergencies with accompanying symptoms, which very well may include headache. An example of a disorder that leads to abrupt severe elevations in blood pressure are preeclampsia and eclampsia associated with pregnancy. 
A severe persistent headache is an associated symptom in such cases, and this condition is secondary to an acute hypertensive crisis. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that 90% of the people who see a physician with a sinus headache actually have migraines, but around 10% actually do have a headache that is associated with the infection itself. So that is a possibility, a potential. With carbon monoxide poisoning, the headache generally presents as a throbbing, dull pain in most cases, but it's extremely variable in presentation. So there's no clear pattern to aid in the diagnosis of a carbon monoxide induced headache. It's usually an accompanying symptom for which treatment is sought. And then the underlying cause, which is carbon monoxide poisoning is then detected. Something that typically is more common um, this time of the year in the United States than it is in the summertime because of um, space heaters or heaters with poor um, carbon monoxide ventilation in a home. Uh, dehydration, metabolic issues. Dehydration results uh, basically in physical, physical shrinking of the brain tissue. So in other words, the brain shrinks in size and that affects the receptors on the coverings of the brain, the dura. Um, that's most commonly encountered in something that we call a hangover. So if you, the effects of alcohol on the body and the brain and the dehydration that accompanies that, um, part of that headache that you're experiencing is secondary to, to dehydration. Um, rebound um, or medication overuse headaches. This is a condition that's essentially a withdrawal effect from an overused analgesic. So in other words, um, you take an analgesic too often and then you stop taking it and you have a bounce back. You have a rebound um, headache as a result. When it comes to stroke, generally strokes that result in sharp stabbing pain um, are those that are on the surface of the brain resulting in a bleed that puts pressure on the mechanical receptors outside of the brain. Same thing when it comes to tumor. Uh, displacement of brain tissue, which stimulates those mechanical receptors. It's interesting that the brain, which is responsible for everything that we feel and everything that we experience, does not have pain receptors within the tissue of the brain itself. There are pain receptors on the dura, the covering of the brain, and um, on the blood vessels and the immediate area surrounding the brain. But the brain itself doesn't have the capacity to feel or to even um, generate a pain signal. The neuronal network within the brain, though, is responsible for our perception of pain. What this means when it comes to tumors, though, is that a tumor generally has to be a fairly large mass to cause pain. It has to put enough pressure on the surrounding tissues um, or nerves um, that it uh, produces symptoms, changes in vision, changes in um, senses, generally. If it results in pain, it's because it's putting enough pressure that's actually putting um, pressure, mechanical pressure, squeezing pressure on those um, sensors that lie on the surface of the brain and the covering of the brain. So the average size brain tumor that's that is identified secondary to complaints of pain, um, generally that it's already grown to about the size of a lemon. Um, so you're talking about something pretty good sized inside the skull to, to produce that effect. Tumors within the brain that are less than two centimeters in size, about an inch or so, uh, tend to be asymptomatic. They, they tend to not produce any symptoms at all. Now, given the nature of traumatic brain injury, which involves a disruption of brain function as a result of trauma or force to the head and brain, it's really no surprise that headache is the single most common symptom described secondary to TBI. Therefore, it's quite often the focus of research and clinical attention. There are several other cardinal features associated with TBI, and these include sleep disturbance, anxiety, depression, mild or major cognitive dysfunction, vestibular symptoms, and a host of others. And an initial clinical assessment after TBI should include assessment and or investigation of this entire constellation of typical brain injury issues. In a 2006 research article, the authors reported a range of 30 to 90% of patients who sustain a TBI who develop some form of headache. Now, more recent data, and this is from 2020, that looked at data from the TBI model systems reported that 44% of the individuals who had sustained a moderate to severe TBI reported headache when they were surveyed at one year post-injury, 
and 71% of that group of individuals surveyed reported having experienced headache at some point during that follow-up period. Now, interestingly, for mild TBI, they reported ongoing headache issues or headache occurring at one year post-injury at 58% as compared to 44 for moderate to severe, and 91% reported having experienced headache at some point during that follow-up period. The interesting point here is that headache is very common following TBI, but in the majority of studies that have looked at this in large population research, it's typically more common following mild TBI than moderate to severe TBI. Mild TBI is much, much more common than moderate to severe TBI. If you look at uh, NIH data, it indicates that around 70 to 90% of all TBIs are mild in nature, concussion being the leading mild brain injury when it comes to percentage of, of injuries. Therefore, headaches are very common to the most frequently encountered range of severity of TBI. That's a little bit counterintuitive. You would think that with a more severe injury, there would be a greater likelihood um, of post-traumatic headache, but that's not the case. Now, although headaches following TBI typically manifest with symptoms consistent with a primary headache disorder, because it is attributable to a very specific injury process, post-traumatic headaches after TBI are considered to be a secondary issue. For the diagnosis of post-traumatic headache, the seven-day threshold that's required for classification of acute post-traumatic headache is needed to establish a causal relationship between injury and the subsequent onset of headache. The seven-day threshold is established on the basis of expert consensus opinion, however, and it's somewhat arbitrary in time. It's an educated guess rather than a result of specific scientific evidence. It's changed over time. In the original ICHD-1, the requirement was 14 days rather than seven. Delayed onset of acute post-traumatic headache allows for a greater period of time, either time from injury or time from regaining consciousness or time from recovering the ability to sense and report pain. And it goes beyond seven days and out to three months post-injury. So that would be considered delayed onset post-traumatic headache. Now, most people have experienced a headache at one time or another pre-injury, and many individuals have a history of primary headaches prior to a TBI, with tension headaches being the most common type and migraine is the second most common type. For those individuals who have a positive history of primary headaches pre-TBI, a worsening of those primary headaches is required for a diagnosis of post-traumatic headache, typically at least a doubling of headache frequency or a doubling of headache severity, or you can have both. In that case, from a diagnostic perspective, you would assign both a primary headache diagnosis and a diagnosis of post-traumatic headache secondary to TBI. In addition to headaches being more frequently present in patients who have experienced a mild TBI, those headaches are reported at a greater degree of severity in presentation relative to survivors of moderate to severe TBI. Of those who report headache after TBI, there's no difference in the frequency of headaches, just in the severity of the reported post-traumatic headaches. And headaches in patients with mild TBI is associated with a higher impact on their life than patients with moderate to severe TBI. Up to 24% of mild TBI patients report severe impact on daily life, a disruption of normal routines or increased difficulty secondary to headache. On self-report measures, patients who have post-traumatic headache are significantly more likely to report depressive symptoms and depressive symptoms at a level that are associated with major depression. In other words, diagnostically significant depressive symptoms. With regard to that reporting of post-traumatic headaches, there's no significant difference in the severity of the brain injury, both with mild and moderate to severe TBI survivors reporting similar rates of depressive symptoms. And we know that depression is much more common across all severities of TBI as compared with the uninjured population. And that's something that is multifactorial in nature. Now, this information is based on reports, systemic reviews, systematic reviews, meta-analyses within the past two to three years. So this slide represents the most recent data is reported within the literature. The types of post-traumatic headaches that are most frequent 
are migraine and probable migraine type headaches. These are common for any severity of TBI and the prevalence is higher after injury than would be expected within the general population. Roughly doubles the uh, prevalence. In a 2020 clinic-based study, it was reported that 91% of a 100 patient sample at a primary headache disorder clinic um, had recurrent headache episodes with migraine-like features. The remaining nine patients had tension type headaches. Now you have to keep in mind that these data are based upon 100 patients that were seeking treatment for headaches from a headache specialist. So there is a selection factor in that. Um, and it's also why the numbers, if you look at it, add up to 100%. It would be rare for 100% to show up in any given population of survey, but in this case, you're surveying people that are seeking treatment for headaches. Now, in another study, also from 2020, that looked at patients with post-traumatic headache who completed a 28-day diagnostic headache diary, and these diaries had clearly defined criteria for classification of either episodic or chronic migraine-like or tension-type headaches, 70% of the subjects reported migraine-like headaches and 30% reported tension headaches. Of those who reported tension headaches, 17% reported episodic tension-type headaches and 13% reported chronic tension-type headaches. So that's 15 or more days per month. Now, like everything having to do with brain injury, there's a tremendous amount of individual variation within those experiencing headaches following brain injury. The relative features of pain complaints of a large group of data can vary substantially from study to study. Because of that variability associated with TBI symptoms, then it's no surprise that headaches after TBI are a complicated issue to study and to treat. And there remains a substantial variability within the headache presentations, diagnosis, and treatment after TBI. Um, the unclassifiable here that is listed uh, as a type is basically um, a headache that features aspects of other classifications in a mixed presentation, none of which are clear enough to make a single uh, diagnostic uh, criteria. Let's talk a little bit about the presentation of headache symptoms and the various classifications after trauma. Now, it's somewhat easy to understand why a headache classified by the presence of central nervous system disruptions would be more common after an injury to the central nervous system, somewhat intuitive. But again, you would also expect that a more severe injury would result in a greater incidence of migraines or headaches in general, and that's simply not the case. While the ICHD3 classifies persistent post-traumatic headache as a secondary condition, there is some controversy regarding this distinction, and some argue that persistent post-traumatic headache is by definition a trauma-triggered migraine condition, and therefore a more primary issue. The use of a qualifier of migraine-like also speaks to the broad phenotype necessary to classify a specific type of headache within the diversity in terms of the specific presence or absence of associated symptoms. There are differences in frequency and duration and intensity of experienced headaches. And the presence of neurological signs like light or sound sensitivity, vestibular dysfunction, dizziness, nausea, these all seem to be a major differentiator in terms of headache classification. And this is the case for migraines in general, but there are some differences in migraines originating from or worsened by TBI. In a study from 2021, the presence of nausea, dizziness, vomiting, sensitivity to light, sound, sensitivity to smell, these are all noted as typical associated symptoms along with the normal aspects of a migraine headache. In other words, these are symptoms that are considered typical for individuals who experience migraines, whether or not they have previously sustained a TBI. But within that 2021 report, Things like difficulty with word finding, that was present in more than half of those reported headache attacks with a higher proportion of symptoms of vestibular and word finding difficulties. So that dizziness, that disruption of balance and word finding difficulties were associated with having post-traumatic headaches of a migraine type within the TBI group. Tension headaches, can be the result of tension, physical tension or emotional um, stress, what we would call, and tends to be associated with a cervicogenic etiology. Um, if your emotional stressors result in chronic neck 
tightness, then this will be reflected by the presence of a tension headache, a physical tightening of those muscles of the shoulder and neck in response to stress, in response to depression, in response to anxiety. This can produce a similar effect of a cervicogenic disruption, which is from the nerves arising from the bones, the joints, the muscles um, in your neck and shoulders that result in increased muscle tension. And of course, you've got muscles on your skull as well. That corresponding feeling of tightness in that area is also something that is associated with a tension type headache. In general, tension headaches have a mild to moderate symptom presentation, and they are not accompanied by nausea or vomiting. Um, again, this gets more complicated in the, in, in the um, instances of post-traumatic headache because there may be some disruption that manifests as neurological symptoms that are a direct consequence of the TBI. You can have both. You can have tension headaches secondary to any one of these issues noted above on this slide um, that are associated with TBI. It can also be a primary disruption of the central nervous system that results in migraine-like presentation. From a diagnostic standpoint, the predominant phenotype, in other words, what it most appears to be is generally gonna be utilized as a primary diagnosis and a guide for the focus of treatment. If most of your symptoms seem to be more migraine-like, then a migraine-like diagnosis is more likely to be attributed and migraine-like treatments are likely to be attempted. These tension headaches are often associated with muscle tension in the muscles of the neck, head, and shoulders. The location of the tension type headache can be indicative of the musculature that is associated with the pain location. It kind of provides a roadmap for what muscles to address when it comes to treatment. So to produce a corresponding reduction in the perceived discomfort, you look at relaxing the muscles in the area where the pain or the discomfort is experienced. Now, the following information is based upon a a uh, systematic review by Anderson and other authors conducted in 2020 and published in the Journal of Head and Face Pain. It's also available through the American um, Headache Society. And it talks about several different studies that looked at um, risk factors, attempting to identify specific risk factors. For issues of acute post-traumatic headache, as defined by the International Classification of Headache Disorders criteria, in this particular study, 100 subjects had presented at the emergency department with mild TBI. There were 59 males and 41 females in this study, mean age about 34 um, years of age. And 66 of those 100 subjects had developed post-traumatic headache. They were surveyed by phone between seven and 10 days post-injury, and then again, around 90 to 100 days post-injury. Um, they used something um, that is a questionnaire, the River Mead Post-Concussion Symptoms Questionnaire. And symptom, subjects who reported acute post-traumatic headache reported on average 4.8 symptoms. So different symptoms that typically are associated um, with headache uh, after mild TBI. And that is compared with only 1.2 symptoms um, for those in the group without post-traumatic headache. So the only significant finding there was actually the number of post-trauma symptoms that the person was reporting. This was a similar finding uh, from a 2014 study that was discussed as well, um, where again, the only significant difference was the difference in the number of symptoms reported. Those who reported post-traumatic headaches on average had 4.1 symptoms as, a, as compared to 1.8 for those without post-traumatic headache. So basically what you can take away from that is, you know, no specific symptom um, was associated necessarily with the development of headaches, but the number of symptoms as it increased made it more likely that headache would be present. And then another study here looked at 138 subjects, all male, all high school, uh, football athletes uh, with a mean age of about 16 years. And of those, 119 out of 138 developed post-trauma headache. Um, so there were no significant findings, however, in any of the factors that they examined with that group. No studies identified that reported specific risk factors for persistent post-traumatic headache as defined by any version 
of the ICHD criteria. In other words, the necessary diagnostic criteria that we talked about earlier for the diagnosis of post-traumatic headaches, the primary difference observed was on the basis of the number of symptoms rather than the specific symptoms themselves. However, there were five other studies within the acute systematic review by Anderson that looked at three months to 60 months follow-up. Most of them were between three and 12 months. And these studies comprised a total of 1,301 civilian adults, and that covered both mild TBI and moderate to severe TBI. From that study, risk factors of age with individuals that were younger more likely to report post-traumatic headaches than individuals who were older, and a prior history of headaches, as well as a prior history of TBI. In other words, individuals who had a traumatic brain injury within this study who had reported a prior TBI before that one um, for, for which they were being studied. So those were all reported with a greater incidence of headaches after injury. So, you know, inconsistent data, basically. Oh, I jumped. There we go. Um, inconsistent data indicated a greater likelihood of development of post-traumatic headache for females within that same 1300 subject study, although the data wasn't consistent across studies, nor did it reflect the nature of the injury, whether it was mild or severe. Given that the studies didn't really feel, fill the uh, ICHD criteria, the authors cautioned against inferring causality for those identified factors and basically said more research in this area needs to be done. So gender and the cause of injury trended, but weren't consistent enough, nor did they go by ICHD criteria. So how and why exactly do headaches occur secondary to TBI? Well, first and foremost, Traumatic brain injury results in structural and functional changes that lead to post-TBI symptoms, one of which is post-traumatic headaches. TBI causes alterations as well in the pain processing and the pain modulation networks in our brain. And this results in an imbalance between pain facilitation and pain inhibition. I often talk about things within the brain uh, being associated with brakes or accelerators. We have a lot of parts of the brain that slow things down, that modulate, that mediate issues. And we have other parts of the brain that make things happen. If you stimulate this part of the brain, something happens. If you stimulate that part of the brain, it stops something from happening. Well, the brain is what is responsible for what we perceive as pain in any sense. Headache is included in that. So there are aspects of the brain that run that pain network, nodes and neural interconnections that are stimulated, that communicate with each other, that result in a perception of pain. There are other aspects of the pain of the central nervous system and the brain um, that modulate that, that dial that down, that inhibit that perception of pain. So if the balance between facilitation and inhibition is tipped in one direction or the other, then you are more likely or less likely to experience pain. So because that imbalance, particularly in the inhibition of pain is thrown off, then you are much more likely to have an enhanced perception of pain. Now, this includes a loss of diffuse noxious inhibitory controls that have been observed in animal studies. And when it comes to human studies, that is associated with a loss of conditioned pain modulation. Again, the brain decides whether or not the signals that it is receiving should result in a perception of pain. And we know that the brain gets a lot better at something that it does more often. Cells that fire together, wire together is an old adage when it comes to neurology. And it is true. When you activate a neural network repeatedly, that network becomes more automated. The automaticity of that means it is more efficient and it runs more easily and often with less input necessary. 
And if you have that combined with a decreased dampening or down, dialing down of pain signals, then those changes in the processing network results in an increased perception of pain. Cortical spreading depression refers not to emotional depression and feelings of sadness, but a depression of neuronal activity at a cortical level. Cortical spreading depression is a slowly propagated wave of depolarization, which then is followed by a period of suppression of brain activity in that region. It is hypothesized as one of the main underlying mechanisms of the migraine aura, particularly visual changes that people may experience as a migraine is beginning or even prior to the perceived onset of the migraine. So suppressing that cortical spreading depression is a common feature of many migraine preventative therapies. It's also been theorized that this cortical spreading depression might directly activate the trigeminocervical system. And we'll talk about that in just a second, resulting in a headache. Now, there are aspects that are considered to be changes to the brain here. Neuroplasticity, again, that are a direct consequence of the post-traumatic headache itself rather than the underlying TBI. In other words, there often are changes in neuroplasticity after a brain injury, some of which are responsible for recovery, some of which might be responsible for development of negative experiences as well, like headache or like chronic pain. Um, either of those can result depending on the neural networks that are repeatedly activated. Now, I mentioned here this trigeminocervical system. Early neurological and neurosurgical studies demonstrated that if you stimulate the intracranial structures, which are innervated by the trigeminal nerve, in this particular case, it is represented by a TG, kind of in the very center, and that yellowish looking nerve that extends uh, behind the eyes and uh, upper uh, part of the frontal lobes. Um, that trigeminal nerve, when stimulated, evoked painful sensations, regardless of the stimulation applied, whether it was mechanical pressure, whether it was chemical in nature, or whether it was a temperature change, all of those stimulations resulted in perception of pain. Now, the trigeminal nerve is one of those cranial nerves that gathers sensory information from the face and the anterior aspects of the covering of the brain, the dura matter, the large cranial vessels that cover the brain. This implied that afferent input, or at least perceived input, is likely to be the neural substrate of pain in primary headache syndromes, particularly migraine and cluster headaches. So if you break it down in that way, the trigeminocervical system is often involved in migraine and cluster headaches, whereas on the surface of the skull, musculature under tension. Um, is more associated with the tension type headaches that are reported. Now, when it comes to this trigeminocervical system, there are similar afferent inputs from the posterior cranial and cervical structures that show similar structure and reactivity upon stimuli. So these are basically lumped together in the trigeminocervical system. And stimulation of any of those aspects on the surface of the brain from nerve roots arising from um, the upper neck, the cervical uh, vertebra area, um, are the tracks in which those are integrated within the thalamus. Stimulation of any of those areas typically result in the perception of pain, and in particular, the perception of headaches. So there's another route that this may um, generate within the brain itself, and this is microglial proliferation. Now, this refers to the brain microphages that become activated and multiply following damage to the cellular makeup of the brain, or as an immune response to conditions following um, injury or infection. Microphage cells are one of the body's first responders to infection or tissue dam damage. Microphages are involved in recognizing and then breaking down or degrading cellular debris or pathogens. The presence and the actions of these cells are accompanied by enhanced inflammatory response in the region in which they're active. It also has the potential to provide stimulation to that trigeminocervical system that I talked about a moment ago with resulting pain signals. 
This persistent inflammation is believed to be connected to the long-term sensitization, again, negative neuroplasticity, which enhances and extends the perceived pain. It's a hypersensitivity. Less signal is needed to kick off that neural network. This results in changes to various brain regions and connectivity, particularly within the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are very much involved with both initiating and inhibiting our sensation and response. So the decreased inhibitory response reduces the ability to modulate any painful stimulus, and that reduces our pain inhibition. This is likely the underlying process of commonly associated increased sensitivity to light and sound, something that would normally be modulated by those frontal inputs inhibiting, but which now causes sensation of pain. It seems like it is a much stronger signal to the brain and the brain reacts to that stronger signal with a lack of inhibition associated with it as intense pain. These are all aspects that are considered to represent physiological changes to the brain. Again, neuroplasticity, changes in structure and function as a result of repetitive firing of a given neural circuit. And these changes that underlie increased pain and perception are a direct consequence of post-traumatic headaches. In other words, the repeated headache itself, not the TBI, has now resulted in this neuroplasticity. The TBI was an initiating event, but a separate and physiological adaptation represents the consequences of those post-traumatic headaches. Now, as we get into treatment aspects, I'll be covering some information that is certainly beyond my scope of practice as a psychologist, but I'm telling you what's reported in the literature. I have to reiterate here, though, that I'm not a physician, I don't prescribe medications, and the information I'm presenting relative to treatment of post-traumatic headaches report, represents data reported in the literature and common treatment recommend, recommendations that are associated with post-traumatic headaches. Now, almost all headache avoidance recommendations start with things that are under our control. That's the first order of business when it comes to headaches. According to the American Migraine Foundation, the primary steps to reduce the frequency and intensity of headaches include these recommended lifestyle changes and avoidance of triggers. These recommendations, although they're associated with migraines, apply to tension headaches as well. And we'll be talking a few, about a few things that are specific to, to tension type headaches. Some of the lifestyle changes include maintaining regular sleep patterns, go to bed at the same time, get up at the same time every day. There are a host of basic sleep hygiene recommendations, which include avoidance of things that might interfere with sleep, light, noise, caffeine before bed. And these are an important consideration to establish and maintain regular sleep patterns. Another one is regular exercise. There are so many aspects of our physical, our cognitive and our emotional health that are directly related to the degree to which we engage in regular exercise. To the degree that we maintain our general health status, our brains benefit. We tend to think of the body and the brain as distinct entities, but our brains are just another part of our physiology. And if our bodies aren't as healthy as we can make them, our brains aren't going to be either. Of all of the things that I can recommend to someone to improve their physical functioning, their emotional functioning, or their cognitive functioning, if you ask me, what can I do? to think sharper and faster, what can I do to lift my mood? Regular exercise applies in each case. It has the strongest evidence base for affecting positively those things that we often wish to improve about ourselves. From a dietary perspective, eating a healthy diet with regular meals, routines, again, can be beneficial, as well as avoiding things like caffeine or excessive alcohol intake or foods that you've learned are a trigger for your specific headache pattern. Some people are sensitive uh, to sulfides, for example. So if you eat or drink something that is rich in that particular molecule, you're more likely to have a headache. Well, avoid that particular thing. Staying hydrated is an important tip to avoiding headaches as well in that dehydration is an issue that can be associated with headache as a causative agent. Dehydration itself can cause headaches. Now, since tension headaches usually reflect stress in some form, 
Well, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to eliminate every form of stress for our lives, but we can be more mindful and aware. We can learn to recognize and dial down our level of stress. Know when you need to take a short break, take a deep breath, and let that stress flow out of those muscles. Take a short walk, sit quietly for a short break, do some simple stretches, particularly neck or upper body, move those muscles. Now, caffeine can be a headache trigger, or rather the rebound effect from caffeine. As caffeine begins to wear off, you can have a headache. I regularly drink a fair amount of coffee in the morning when I come to work. So if on the weekend I get out of my regular routine and I don't make coffee, by the middle of the afternoon, I can probably feel a little bit of a dull ache beginning. And that is a withdrawal effect uh, for caffeine. But interestingly enough, caffeine is a component of many headache remedies. A lot of, you know, Excedrin has caffeine in it. When you stop taking caffeine, the effect wears off. The expansion of the blood vessels can cause pain. But caffeine, when you take it, shrinks those blood vessels around the brain. So if part of what you're experiencing is that mechanical stimulation of the trigeminal cervical system that we talked about earlier, then caffeine in the short term can make it feel a little bit better, but in the long term is more likely to extend uh, that pain. Now, for occasional headaches, this is the kind of run-to-the-mill, um, not chronic headaches, not migraine headaches, but just, you know, tension headaches that occur on an occasional basis, over-the-counter over the pain meds are the primary mechanism. So um, Tylenol, uh, Advil, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, um, prescription medications, certainly for migraine headaches, and we'll go through a slide of those in just a moment. Um, relaxation therapy and meditation, again, things to reduce your stress, biofeedback therapy to learn um, which muscles are under tension and how can you identify, isolate, and relax those muscles with some degree of feedback to know that you're doing it correctly. Stretching, massage, those are things that can be helpful, things that you can just do in the moment as well. Acupuncture, heat, or ice packs uh, can be helpful as well. Um, again, kind of going up in levels of inter intervention. Um, injections are sometimes done with specific nerves when it is an identified as a nerve issue. And then when it comes to uh, treatment of post-traumatic headaches, if they are recurrent, if they're more than a couple of times a week, um, then looking at very similar strategies for those occasional, but then often with the addition of medications. Um, and the vast majority of medications that are uh, prescribed for headaches um, are those that are typically utilized for other things. For example, antidepressant medications typically affect neurotransmitters that serve several different functions in the body, which include the brain's processing of pain or networks that modulate signals. Anti-seizure medications or anti-convulsant medications are used to treat people with epilepsy, but they can also dial down or interfere with our body's overactive transmission of signals from damaged nerves when you have a neuropathy or overly sensitive nerves as well. And then one medication that's used to treat high blood pressure, which is called propranolol, has been shown to reduce pain symptoms in patients with chronic pain. Propranolol and metoprolol, another beta blocker, have also been shown to be effective in preventing migraine headaches in particular uh, but also reduced tension type headaches as well. And then Botox, you've heard of Botox before for relaxing muscles. Botox was actually approved by the FDA in 2010 for use with chronic migraine. So headaches that are more than 15 days per month, the FDA has approved Botox as a primary treatment uh, for that as well. And then there is a laundry list of medications that can be utilized with migraines or at the first sign of an oncoming migraine. The information on this slide is accessible at the Mayo Clinic website listed at the bottom of the slide and also within the reference slides at the end of the presentation. These are known as acute or abortive treatments. In other words, they are designed to interrupt or stop the symptoms of an acute migraine when a migraine is detected or when the migraine aura that I talked about earlier changes in vision or some other sense um, or, an, or a warning sign or red flag that a migraine may be coming. So just a different uh, collection of uh, medications that potentially can be used either to interrupt a migraine that is beginning. Each of them come with their own 
um, warnings as well. So again, it would be something that your physician um, should talk with you about in determining which medication, um, if any of those could be utilized. You notice on there an interesting one as well, opioid medications. Um, historically, for people who can't take other migraine medications, um, some narcotic medications have been shown to be helpful. But again, these are highly addictive and they also, um, your body adapts to them over time. So they're usually only utilized if no other treatments have been uh, shown to be effective. That last one, anti-nausea drugs, more of a supplement, not a pain treatment, but some of the associated treatments. If you have migraines that are accompanied by nausea and vomiting, you might be put on medications to uh, help with nausea as well. So bottom line, to wrap up the presentation, the takeaway message from all this information is that headaches are very, very, very common following TBI, especially mild TBI, and most TBIs are mild in nature. So there is an increased incidence and prevalence for headache following TBI. It really is incumbent upon providers treating individuals who've sustained a TBI to assess and treat as needed, not only just immediately after injury, but also over the course of recovery and follow-up because that delayed onset um, is also associated. The more severe the injury, in my professional experience, the more likely that delayed onset is. Since headaches are very common outside of TBI, the one positive here is that there are a lot of different options for treatment. So there are a lot of different methods and means in which you can go about attempting to treat your headache symptoms. So because it is such a common um, symptom, even outside of TBI, uh, there are a lot of options that you can pursue. But that, that information and education being provided to patients, being provided to family, I think that is important um, to be able to be aware of uh, that increased risk and the treatment options that are available. At the end of the slide set here, and I will um, talk with somebody there with the Brain Alliance to find out um, how best we can get these available to you, but I can make these slides available for these, uh, for these resources, as well as all the information that's contained within this presentation. And this is my direct contact information. If you have questions, um, please feel free to contact me and I'll try to be helpful um, with my response.